Hey guys, welcome back to more family drama stories. In this video, my crazy golden child sister called the police and told them that I stole my own son from another family. Here is what happened. Let's dive right into the video. And the first one starts like this. So I am a white South African man who is married to a beautiful woman from Nigeria. My country has a history of racist policies and conflicts, so when I met my wife and wanted to marry her, I chose to move from my family home to Cape Town in order to be in a more accepting city that would not allow me or her to feel pressured by people who would judge us because of our skin colors. I always say that the second happiest moment of my life was marrying my wife. The first was the birth of my son, he is my pride and joy and even though he's only a few months old, I know that I would do anything to make sure he has the happiest life possible. And to do that, I had to go through a trial so absurd that I was not sure if my little family would make it. Let me begin by saying that there was another reason I moved further away from my family home. My mother and father are, well, we'll say tolerant of my wife and her skin tone, but my older golden child sister, we will call her Izzy, my parents always liked her much more than me for some reason, is very racist and does not hide that fact. When I first met my wife, Izzy was very much against our relationship, just for the fact that I was white and my wife was black. I cut my visits to my family down because of this and ever since my son was born, every small gathering I do have that includes Izzy has her talking about how dark my son is or how it would have been better if I married someone of my own kind. My sister is an adult but I've brought this up to my parents several times and while they are cordial to my wife and son, they don't see anything wrong with my sister's behavior. Things came to a head during my wife's birthday. She wanted to invite my family since we'd be visiting her family in Nigeria later in the month, so I begrudgingly did so because she wanted them to be a part of her celebration. When Izzy got to my house, she was immediately dismissive of my wife, not even saying hello when coming in. When she saw my son, she immediately made a comment about how I would have thought after a few months his skin would have lightened up. I grit my teeth as did my wife, hoping that the comment was all she was gonna say about it. Izzy continued to bring up my son's dark skin to my parents, commenting to them that he doesn't even look like a part of the family. She then proceeded to go on a very racist tirade that I will not repeat her, as some of the words she used should not even be typed up. That did it for me and I told her to get out of my house. I was done with her behavior towards my wife and son and was not gonna tolerate it anymore. She tried to plead with me but I was done. My parents tried to cover for her claiming that they were just comments and that she didn't mean any harm. I then told them to get out too if that was how they truly felt. So my wife's birthday was basically ruined but I felt some relief that I would hopefully not have to deal with them again. The next morning right before I left for work there was a knock at the door. Two policemen men were standing on my doorstep, my sister behind them stating that they were here for a welfare check on a child. I told them that the child they were referring to was my son and he was currently asleep. My sister chimed in that I couldn't hide the truth for much longer and in confusion I asked what she was talking about. Izzy said that the officers were here to uncover a trafficking ring I was apparently concealing. I told the officers that this had to be a joke and they said that regardless of how outlandish the accusation, they still needed to investigate. I told my wife to bring my son along with his birth certificate while the police asked me questions. My wife did so, placing my son into a small crib in our living room and presenting the documents to the police. Izzy was quick to claim it was a forgery and that my wife and I were gonna sell my son to the highest bidder once he was old enough. The police thankfully were very kind with their questions, making sure to ignore my sister's insistence on checking out rooms in my home for secret crawl spaces where I hid my future victims. My wife was still distraught and I wanted to try and end this situation as soon as I could, if only to get back to having a mostly normal day. I told the police that my sister was doing this because she was racist and she chimed in that I should tell the police about the regular trips I take to Nigeria with my wife. I explained that my wife was from Nigeria and that they could confirm with her family that we visit every few months. While the police were questioning me, Izzy did something I never thought she'd do. She took my son out of his crib and attempted to run out the door with him. My wife saw her and screamed at the police to grab her before she got into her car to drive away. The police were slow to react, I don't think they expected my sister to do something like that and tried to run after her. 
Instead of the police stopping her, one of my neighbors down the street was able to distract her and keep her from running any further with my son. This neighbor, we will just call him Chuck, was able to tell the police about mine and my wife's innocence and he also worked as a family attorney, so he said he was willing to put his job on the line to defend us. He spoke to my sister asking her why she would tell such an outrageous story. Izzy claimed it was not a story and Chuck found a way to trip her up in her words so that she was not telling the same story she told the police. Izzy became almost hysterical, trying to get away from Chuck and claiming that the baby couldn't have been mine because he's too dark, he's as dark as your wife and that doesn't happen. My wife, who had followed the police out to try and grab my son, was silent but handed her phone over to one of the officers. As it turned out, she had recorded my sister's racist rant the day before which told the officers that she knew the baby was my son and was just angry because he was dark-skinned. The police arrested Izzy because of the attempted kidnapping, but also for filing a false police report. I press charges against Izzy and me and my wife are just waiting for the day in court to arrive. For now we are trying to get back to some sort of normalcy. My mother and father have apologized for their behavior, ashamed that they allowed their daughter to become the type of person that would be willing to take a child from his family. I'm just glad things are settling now and cannot wait to visit my wife's family later this month. Update, it's been about 6 months since that awful day when my sister tried to kidnap my son. A lot has happened and I wanted to share an update on how things have turned out for my family. First the legal stuff. So Izzy's case went to court pretty quickly. The prosecutor charged her with attempted kidnapping, filing a false police report and a hate crime. Her lawyer tried to argue that she had some kind of mental breakdown, but the judge was not buying it. The recording my wife made of Izzy's racist rant the day before was key evidence. It showed that she knew exactly who my son was and was acting out of racial prejudice. In the end, Izzy took a plea deal. She got 3 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 18 months plus 5 years probation after that. She also has to go through mandatory counseling and take classes on racial sensitivity. The judge made it clear that if she violates her probation or commits any other crimes after getting out, she'll be back in prison for a long time. I know some people might think that's a harsh sentence for a first time offender. However, the judge said attempted kidnapping of an infant is an extremely serious crime and he also said the racist motivation made it even worse. I agree with him, what Izzy said and did was not just wrong, it was dangerous. Who knows what could have happened if she managed to drive off with my son that day. As for me and my wife though, we decided to sue Izzy in civil court too. Our lawyer said we had a strong case for intentional infliction of emotional distress. We did not really care about getting money from her, but we wanted to send a message that her actions had serious consequences. The case was pretty straightforward given the criminal conviction. The judge awarded us $100,000 in damages. Izzy does not have that kind of money, so her wages will be garnished for years after she gets out of prison. My parents were pretty shaken up by everything that happened. They came to us and apologized again for enabling Izzy's behavior for so long. They admitted they should have shut down her racist comments years ago instead of making excuses for her. It was good to hear them take responsibility, but I told them it would take time to rebuild trust. We've been going to family counseling together. It's helping us work through a lot of old issues, not just the recent drama with Izzy. My parents are learning to confront their own biases and prejudices that they didn't even realize they had. They are making an effort to educate themselves about racism and to be more welcoming to my wife and son. One good thing that came out of this mess though is that it brought me closer to some of my extended family. A few of my cousins reached out after hearing what happened and they were horrified by Izzy's actions and wanted to show their support. We've been getting together more often now and it's nice to have family around to accept us without judgment. As for my neighbor Chuck, he has become a good friend. He did not have to get involved that day, but he stepped up to help us when we really needed it. We have him and his family over for dinner pretty regularly now. His kids love playing with my son. Speaking of my son though, he is doing great. He is walking now and starting to say a few words. It amazes me every day how quickly he is growing and learning. My wife and I are determined to raise him to be proud of who he is and where he comes from. We talk to him both in English and Igbo, my wife's native language, and make sure he's exposed to both of our cultures. We did end up taking that trip to Nigeria to visit my wife's family again and it was exactly what we needed after all the stress. Being surrounded by my wife's loving relatives, seeing how they doted on our son, it reminded me of what really matters. 
We are planning to go back for an extended stay next year, so our son can spend more time with that side of the family. And yeah, ripe stars, I would say that entitled racist stupid golden child sister certainly got what she deserved. But I'm curious, if you would have been in OP's shoes, what would you have done about your entitled golden child sister? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed these relationship stories, then please don't forget to like the video and maybe even subscribe to not miss any of my daily uploads. Thank you so much and the next one is another revenge story. So my ex-sister-in-law was the type to put on airs and tell everyone how well to do she and her husband wear. Christmas was hell because she always gave out a list of expensive gifts she wanted and would not accept anything not on the list. This was not a two-way street. For example, the year that sticks in my mind was the year she insisted I buy her a really expensive scarf from a local boutique. We of course couldn't afford it, so I spent three months looking for a scarf made from the same material and a pattern so close you would never know the difference unless you were my sister-in-law. She opened her gift and instantly looked at the label. She huffed, rolled her eyes and put it on the floor next to her slippers and opened all her other gifts. No thank you or anything. The next day she had posted on social media about the pile of crap she got for Christmas with a picture of the scarf. Most of her friends simpered over her being so butthurt and asked who I thought I was buying her such cheap crap. Some though said the scarf was gorgeous and was so similar to the expensive one that they could not really tell the difference. These people were quickly put down for also being cheap, but cue my petty revenge. I waited 12 months, refused to look at her gift list and ordered her gift. Christmas day at her house again, she wouldn't go to her other family members houses as they were all not as nice as her house, so we all had to spend our Christmas day in the car for 2 plus hours going to hers. I then handed her a small envelope and she looked pleased. I later discovered that she had asked for some gift vouchers for a really expensive jewelry shop. She excitedly opened it to find an Oxfam voucher for 50 pounds to provide a foreign village with manure for their crops. The message I wrote was, at least this year, when you tell everyone you got a pile of crap for Christmas, you won't be wrong. Everyone burst out laughing, she was unaware that I knew about the moaning from the previous year and the look on her face was worth all the nastiness from her until I finally divorced her ass of a brother who left me three weeks after my brain tumor diagnosis. Just for context. The year of the scarf we were gifted her two children's school photos and two cheap picture frames from Tesco, the year of the crap we got tea towels. And now we got another revenge story which is centered around a landlord. So when I, 62 female, was about 19 years old I rented a small one bedroom duplex. The other part of the duplex was a 2BR unit that the landlord daughter lived in. The landlord's house was on the same property and there was a shared driveway that split and went to each place, this will come up later. My rent was due on the 10th of each month and the landlord had the utilities all on one and charged me in the middle of the month according to usage. One month I walked up to her house to pay the rent. I always paid it on the first Wednesday of the month but she did not answer the door. I tried again later in the day and still no answer. I tried again the next day, still no answer and I knew she was home. This time I had the check in an envelope and left it in the door slot. This was on the 6th of the month, I had a feeling something was up. The landlord was avoiding me, the next day I came home from work and there was a 24 hour notice to vacate for non-payment. I tried contacting the landlord, she would not respond, this was on the 8th of the month, the next day the landlord shut off my electricity and gas heat, it happened to snow that day and I went down to the legal aid office and although they couldn't go to court with you, they could give you advice and the attorney called my landlord to see if they could help resolve whatever was going on. The attorney advised who he was and where he was from. The landlord barely let him get this out, she started screaming at him so loud I could hear her and she said, no effing government employee or anyone was gonna tell her how to run her properties and hung up. And the attorney looked at me and said, we are going to fry her an ass. This is where the driveway comes into play. It's a single dirt road which splits and goes to my place or farther to her house. By the time I got home and was pulling in my driveway, there was sheriff's car in front of her own house. Apparently the legal aid attorney had filed a restraining order against my landlord due to her shutting off my gas heat which was a threat against me. 
the landlord called legal aid and she was told she needed to get an attorney since she was not willing to work with a government employee. After all was said and done, I got 45 days to move 3 months rent, utilities and deposits paid plus $5,000. That was a lot of money back then, probably 10 times of what it would be today. And the reason for all of this? Well, her other daughter was moving from Hawaii and she wanted the unit for her. Instead of just giving me a 30 day no cost notice, she did it her way and it cost her a lot of money. I never did talk to her again, but I do know she could not use her driveway until I moved. And now let's move on to the next story. It starts like this. A story here from Southeast Asia where the HOAs are sadly plentiful and usually evil. I also know that this story might cause controversy due to the world and even science not agreeing if electric cars are really better than gas for the environment. Either way, I don't want this story to focus on that and I hope it can be put aside for the main point, which is the HOA. So when I first got my Tesla, the HOA approached me and told me that I should not have an electric car. And also that it will mean wires running around my yard and looking bad. They started with that and ended up with a scenario of the entire neighborhood burning down to a crisp, all because I own this electric car. Well, where I live, the HOAs have different rules and amounts of control. They are designed to help decide where some tax funding goes and speak on the behalf of the community. They don't formally have the right to create rules for us to follow follow, but they do it anyway. Breaking the rules can get you in some annoying situations with them. Our HOA did not actually have rules against electric cars, so they couldn't really do anything about me getting one or keeping it. The rules were old and written before the big electric car grace. I did not see a big deal and it wasn't as if I was trying to stretch a cord across a street or anything, my car was gonna be right next to where I plugged it in. Still, they wanted to have a huge fight with me about it. I'm the kind of person that you don't want to mess with because I will come at you even harder. They gave me problems for weeks and went so far as to unplug my car when I was sleeping so I would not be able to drive to work in the morning. Very immature and childish, but now it was my turn to bite back. I noticed other people in the area were getting electric cars, but charging them was not as simple. I lived on a big area of land and they were in apartments. With cars either parking in the street or a parking garage, no real way to charge their cars which just sucked. I took a small part of my land and with a lot of help from experts on the matter, built a car charging station on my property. Now anybody with an electric car would just come up and charge the car without worrying. The HOA was super mad about this and actually filed a lawsuit against me. They were claiming that I was causing a danger to the neighborhood as well as having an illegal business and of course destroying the environment with my charging station. The first one would be harder to fight but I was prepared for the second part of this and was smart enough to think ahead. So when I found myself in court trying to defend myself I was asked the golden question. Court, are you running a business illegally? Me, I'm not running a business at all. Court, but you admit to having the charging station on your property, yes? Me, yes. Court, and you gain profit from this? Me, no sir, people can charge the cars for free there. I don't charge anything, I just want to give back to the community. Yeah, I knew that if I was going to ask for money I would need permits, licenses, etc. And it was true that I did not charge people anything for this. However, that did not stop them from giving me gifts such as food or other things, that was just them being kind back and helping the community run. Not only did it save me from getting in trouble, but it looked good too in court. That I was doing the HOA job of helping the community instead of them. The harder thing was that the HOA was claiming that I posed a serious danger to the neighborhood. For this they came in with a big shot lawyer and a ton of studies that I didn't understand in the slightest. I'd gotten the area checked out as my lawyer suggested, but that didn't seem good enough for the HOA. HOA, studies have linked explosions with electric car batteries and even charging stations. The Teslas in the neighborhood are a danger. NOP is adding to that with a charging station. It needs to be removed for everyone's safety. The HOA is working on trying to get a ban on these cars due to this danger. And well, if you're reading this, it might seem that this is a pretty good argument. I won't lie and say that I know the science or that the Teslas are safe, I do know though that they are safe enough to be legally sold and owned. And I had paperwork that showed the station was tested and deemed safe. 
The truth of the matter was that the HOA didn't care about safety or any of that stuff. They flat out told me that they thought Tesla cars looked like weird spaceships and didn't give off the vibe for the neighborhood they wanted. Of course they would lie in court about motives to make themselves look better and have a better chance of winning. They, or at least their lawyer, knew how to play the system, I'll give them that. I could have seen the result going either way, but even if I had to remove the station it was worth it to cause them hassle. Instead, it was found in my favor that I should keep being able to run the station to allow people with electric cars an easy and accessible way to charge them. The judge also told the HOA as a little advice that any attempt to ban specific cars that were already approved by the government would never hold up if attempted to be enforced. They are just the HOA, not the law. Things don't end here though because I ended up getting even more revenge on the HOA after finding out about some forms and petitions I could get going. So it would have me forfeiting ownership of that part of my land to the government. In exchange though, the station would be maintained, aka I suppose the charging station, and paid for by funds. The same funds that the HOA gets a say in how it is spent. This means that now they have less because I proved that a charging station is needed and good for the community as a whole. I did not mind losing a tiny bit of land in the battle against the HOA if it meant winning in the long run. Hell, it meant I never had to go far to charge my car and most people still remember who it was that got the electric car charging station up and running in the first place. I'm sure it won't last forever, but it feels good to be the person that gets a bunch of food and gift cards as a thank you. Never got to be that person before and I honestly was not trying to gain anything out of it. It was just in my personality to fight the HOA back harder for messing with me. And yeah guys, with this we have reached the end of the video. However, if you cannot get enough of my content, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel to not miss any of my daily uploads. And also check out my podcast by searching for Ripe Stories on Spotify, Amazon, Audible and other podcast platforms. You will often find exclusive episodes and early access to new content. Furthermore, please check out my Patreon by going to patreon.com slash ripe YouTube or my YouTube membership program for even more exclusive stories. Thank you so much and I will see you again tomorrow.